Um, welcome everyone. Summer series, um, which is our July-August tradition now, um, where we're all trying to learn the things that we're supposed to know um, and might have forgotten. And this summer we've um, uh, collected a lot of great speakers from the specialties that sort of touch neurology. So non-neurologists that are going to talk to us about uh, neuro-relevant topics. Um, today we have Dr. Brett Stacy um, talking to us. He's a um, he's an anesthesiologist who um, whose pain um, career started in Pittsburgh, and then he spent a lot of time at OHSU, um, where he was the uh, division chief of pain medicine, uh, the fellowship director for pain, and um, a professor of pain, and then came here only two years ago, I think, um, and is the director of the UW Center for Pain Relief. Um, and so he's going to tell us a lot about a lot of neuro-relevant pain issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is probably not what you were thinking about, but it's hard to avoid, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, First thing, new things. There's always new things, right? Change is constant. It's all the time. There's new meds, there's new guidelines, there's new understanding about old meds, there's definitely new rules and regulations, there's new research. There's new personnel. You hire a new faculty person who does something and suddenly we're all doing that and paying attention to that. Um, and new topics and then there's things that have been elsewhere but suddenly come to UW and make some new here in this environment. So I was thinking about five new things it is impossible to avoid the thing I don't want to talk about either, which is opioids. Um, since coming to the state of Washington, I've turned into a reluctant opioid person. So I now get to travel to Alaska to talk to them about their state Alaska opioid problem, get invited to go places to talk about opioids, because we have this reputation here that we've kind of improved things. Um, but it doesn't keep it from being a national problem and a big deal thing. So we're talking about opioids, maybe a little bit ad nauseum, but that's okay. And then a, a spinal cord stimulation. When I gave Graham rounds before here, I talked about spinal cord stimulation, but since then, it's just hard to imagine, the world has completely changed in spinal cord stimulation. So just literally in the last year or so, what's available for spinal cord stimulation has completely changed. The efficacy has changed. It's completely different. Another thing to think about is, I, I, I look through your notes quite a bit, because I see a lot of neuropathic pain patients. It's really my main interest is neuropathic pain. Um, I, I think we underemphasize what can be done with the body to help people accommodate to their neuropathic pain conditions and neurologic deficits. And there's some emerging evidence that that is really true. We can use our bodies differently. And then another thing that really impacts anybody who sees a patient with pain is evolving understandings of central sensitization and how a lot of conditions have a lot more in common than we think they do. And then finally, just a couple of things about what's new at the Center for Pain Relief. So the other thing is, there's not very many of us here. If you have a question or a comment or a concern, don't save it, just kind of interrupt me. I'd rather just have a discussion. So please talk and let's talk as we go. Okay. Like I said, we can't avoid talking about opioids because they're, they're everywhere. Um, it's what patients think about when they think about pain treatment, they think about opioids. There are new guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control which impact um, prescribers across the board. There's a new role for naloxone um, in, in chronic opioid therapy. And then there's Tepenadol, which is the only opioid that's specifically FDA approved for a neuropathic pain condition. And then there's the topic of headaches, which I'm not going to really touch about, but it's clear that opioids produce headaches um, in patients who don't have them before, and worse than headaches in patients who already have them. So I have a whole bunch of conflicts, which are mainly clinical in this opioid area. I have in the distant, distant past been a consultant to a company, which they never invited me back after they heard my comments mm -hmm. about opioids. But um, here's, here's my conflicts, and they're all really clinical, which is... My opinion today is not the same as it was a year ago or five years ago. Um, I absolutely believe opioids are completely overused. I think there's a small subset of chronic pain patients for whom they are helpful, um, and a small subset of chronic neuropathic pain patients for whom they're helpful. 
I absolutely no, no idea how we're going to use opioids in the future. Um, I completely think that pharma drives a lot of the problem, and they make up solutions for us. So their solutions for us are to make the opioid more tamper-proof, or to make it last longer, or to try to add something to it so it bites the constipation at the same time, to make it 10 or 20 times as expensive as if it didn't have it in it. <clears throat> um, and finally, I, I do think that dependadol and tramadol are unique drugs, and they are different from the other opioids, and we should think about using them in a different kind of way. So the thing that's unique, there's multiple things unique about opioids. They're the only class of medication that really can relieve any kind of pain. They're available by more routes of administration than any other class of medication. And that includes oral, transdermal, intravenous, epidural, intrathecal, buccal, rectal. You can administer them by antiphoresis. You can put them in the vagina. You can inhale them. There's a lot of ways you can use opioids. And some of those are FDA approved. There's a whole bunch of formulations. You know, there's short-acting, immediate release formulations, there's long-acting, there's abuse deterrent, there's ones that are combined with acetaminophen or ibuprofen or something else. There's mixed agonists and there's atypical opioids. There's a gigantic dose range, just unparalleled, unparalleled with any other class of medications, about the dose that someone will say is effective or, quote, doesn't touch them. <coughs> there's absolutely no consensus on how to use them. And I don't think they benefit most chronic pain patients. And the bonus is that they get abused. And they have all kinds of special regulations. And they kill a bunch of people. And there's an emotional component to discussing this topic, no matter how you go about discussing it. So it's, you know, it's a great bonus. It's just an unavoidable bonus that's always there. The Institute of Medicine issued this landmark um, um, white paper, Relieving Pain in America, in 2011. It talked about how you know, pain of all forms costs billions and billions of dollars in the country and how big of a deal it is. This is what they had to say about opioids. If you read it, it says, gosh, we need opioids for cancer pain at the end of life and uh, in acute pain. That's kind of all they say. They don't say, you know, in selected chronic pain patients, they don't even bother to go there. So acute postoperative pain and procedural pain and end of life. So that's not really how they're used a lot of the time. Then you go look at the literature. So most prospective and or randomized trials um, are a four to eight weeks duration, occasional 12 weeks duration. That's not really what we think about when we think about long-term opioid therapy. There's very little prospective data on some of the longer-term consequences like hyperalgesia, headaches, sleep disturbances, endocrine changes, bone density, tolerance, etc. In a recent Review concluded evidence is insufficient to determine the effectiveness of long-term opioid therapy for improving chronic pain and function. Evidence supports a dose-dependent risk for serious harms. The higher the dose, more likely you are to die or have something else bad happen. In neuropathic pain, the evidence is kind of sketchy. Cochrane Review concluded, uh, can't be convinced. Multiple opioid downsides, minimal evidence, they can make the pain worse. Um, Minimal evidence for a lot of things for which they're prescribed, like fibromyalgia, chronic abdominal pain, headaches. Um, multiple endocrine effects, they can impair function and promote all kinds of sleep disturbances. Prescription is often driven by things you're not expecting, like anxiety. People who come to a doctor's appointment with a pain complaint and concomitant anxiety more likely to get a prescription for opioids. Same thing for depression, same thing for PTSD, same thing to do for overall distress level and their physical manifestations of their pain. So it's a bunch of stuff that isn't driven by any studies we do or any objective assessment. It can come to dominate clinical care. For instance, women who receive opioids are less likely to get a pel annual pelvic exam, less likely to get a mammogram, all kinds of things. And the deaths really did skyrocket, a 260% increase. It's huge, um, and it keeps on going. So we know about these things, these adverse effects are opioids, and this is the stuff you hear about for the most part. But there's a bunch of other things that, that are out there. So the deaths, let's go to a little bit of detail. Most recent data, 44 people a day die of prescription overdose death. That's a lot. Adds up to 16,000 or so in a year. Mostly in their productive age range of 25 to 54. 
deaths in women increase a lot. And women used to lag behind, but now they're catching up. There's frequently polypharmacy, and that polypharmacy often involves benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines are involved in 7,000 overdose deaths in the United States in the most recent year available. Um, and then there's women. Women are, have interesting extra risks. They're more likely to receive opioids from visiting a doctor. Uh, now there's evidence that says, suggests they get higher opioid doses. They're more, more likely to have conditions that don't respond to opioids, like migraines, fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis. It can cause infertility, maybe menorrhea. It's not a complicating feature of pregnancy. It can possibly increase the risk of birth defects. Polypharmacy with sedating medications is more common in women. Um, and women misuse the medications for different reasons. Men are more likely to be diverting the medication than women. Women are more likely to be using it as a, to treat emotional problems and, and to use it as a for not use it themselves personally for a non-prescribed reason. Men are more likely to sell to somebody else. Here's a new concept about opioids themselves causing depression not just being driven by a prescription. We have data for that. We've had that for years. This is new. If you look at people prescribed an opioid, follow them over time, they're more likely to get depression than people with the same kind of pain problem, not prescribed an opioid. And then if you look at dose, dose matters. Low dose doesn't really seem to produce that much depression. Doses above 50 milliequivalents a day associated with an almost threefold increase in risk of depression. So higher dose is more depressing. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia. This idea has been bounced around for many years. Um, and it's an interesting use of the word hyperalgesia, because you know, in clinical medicine, we think of hyperalgesia as increased pain from a stimulus that normally causes pain. But in OIH, it's the paradoxical lowering of the pain threshold, which isn't really hyperalgesia, but that's what we call it. Um, it can develop relatively quickly. Um, no one really knows all the mechanisms behind it. Um, and it definitely impacts everything. So if someone on opioids comes to the operating room, they are, are a lot more likely to have more pain, require more pain, medica pain medication with that, oper with that uh, surgery. Someone on opioids coming for a procedure, more likely to complain of pain with subcutaneous infiltration of localized psych than someone with the same level of pain not on opioids. So all kinds of interesting things with that. And so it's still an area of controversy. I think it's a real thing. I think we see it all the time in the pain clinic when we look for it, um, and there's increasing data to support that. Opioids impact sleep. They impact sleep because they increase both central sleep apnea as well as obstructive sleep apnea. And if you take people off opioids, their sleep disorder breathing can improve. So it's not a one-way street. You can make it better by stopping them and, and getting rid of them. So thinking about all those things, People dying, not good evidence, lots of bad, there, bad other things happening. The CDC realized that really there's a national crisis about opioids in our country. And then there's centers for disease control, so they should probably do something about it. Even though they traditionally hadn't really thought about it. This is a topic for them to explore. So there was a group that came together starting in, I believe, 2013. There were several people involved from the University of Washington and from our pain group in this process. And they released their guide. Their guidelines were, we, everybody knew they were coming for a long time. And they finally were, were released in March of this year. They have 12 core recommendations, which we're going to go over in a minute. They're definitely controversial, and they've definitely been a topic for much debate. So the bottom two of those links, if you can get a copy of this, are Medscape things, talking about you know, how crappy these guidelines are. And one of them, actually a friend of mine, did a little video commentary about how bad it is. So I'm dying to talk with him about it next time I see him, because I hadn't noticed it before. Um, when I look at these guidelines, and I go back and I looked at a presentation I gave six years ago at the University of Wisconsin, which I said, here's like a way to think about prescribing opioids. I swear it matches these guidelines. I do not think they're unreasonable in any way whatsoever. And I'd be happy to have a discussion if there's interest later about it. So here they are. There's 12 main things. It's a hundred and something page document, but here's the 12 core things. And there's the longer version and the shorter version. Let's just let, let read the shorter version out loud together. Opioids are not first line or routine therapy for chronic pain. 
Anybody want to disagree with that one? So I, I think we can agree on that. Every single one of my kids. <laughs> so, yeah, who are on opioids once they're on, right? But but I can have a whole entire day. I can see a dozen patients and have no one talk about opioids, and they're all coming to the chronic pain clinic. So they haven't quite read this. They don't. It, it, it's because they iatrogenically receive them from a doctor who didn't read that, didn't think about it this way. So this is really an iatrogenic problem, and it's really a change. So if you go back. 30 years ago, this wasn't a general belief. If you go to other countries, it's not the same kind of belief. So it's something about us. Here's another one. This is really well, bad. We have better drugs now, alternative strategies, right? It isn't just about uh, changing the attitude towards opioids. We have better drugs. Now. Better, meaning better opioids? No, better non opioids. Yeah, we've always, yeah, exactly. So there's, a, I can treat. 95% of the patients I see without opioids and, and not even have to talk about them for the most part. Second thing, this is, this is also radical, establish and measure goals for pain and function. What are my treatment goals? Like if you're treating hypertension, the goal is to get normotension. We all know that we often see patients who are being treated for hypertension will say, you'll notice their blood pressure is up. They say, oh, I take a medication for that. Well, it's not working. <laughs> so we need to rethink those medications. Same thing for the pain and function. I'm taking the OxyContin for that. Then why are you coming to see me at a tertiary care pain clinic? Because your pain's not well controlled. We need to think differently. It's not working. Let's change it. So you need to have goals up front, though. You need to say, what are our goals for therapy? What are, what are we trying to accomplish with this? And patients need to know that there's risks associated with them and, and really what the degree of benefit they're going to receive is. I challenge you to find me an opioid study in which that's a controlled perspective study. It doesn't have to be placebo controlled. It's a controlled perspective study that is not an enriched enrollment design that shows pain relief less than 30, I mean more than 30 percent. It's modest reduction in pain for the most part. That's what they get. The risk people don't know about. They don't know about you know, their gonads that aren't going to work and things like that. When starting opioid therapy for chronic pain, clinicians should prescribe immediate release opioids instead of extended release or long acting opioids. That is a big change. I remember talking about time contingent dosing makes the patient not think about their pain, they just, they just take it as a routine, they, they, they don't have to be focused on the medications. It turns out that, that may be partially true, but also results in overall higher doses of medication and people take immediate release medications. When Opioids are started, you should start with the lowest dose. In doses above 50, morphine equivalents a day are associated with more complications. You should really, really pause if you're going to go above 90 mil equivalents a day. It's a little bit lower than the, the Washington State guidelines, but similar idea. Long-term opioid use often starts with acute pain treatment. So ineffectively treating the acute pain leads to ongoing pain. And if you use opioids, kind of indiscriminately up front becomes you're using them indiscriminately later on, too. So they're urging us to have caution and thought about prescribing in the acute phase and to think about multimodal analgesia from the get-go, not wait till way later to bring it, to bring it there. And then reevaluate benefits and harms early on, like just a few weeks after you start opioids for chronic pain condition. Don't just say, I've seen a couple months. That's too long. See them soon and, and decide where things are. Should also evaluate the risk factors for opioid related harms, and that includes sleep apnea, includes diversion, includes not responding to the, to the um, medication. You should look at the prescription drug monitoring program for your state. Here, it's much easier than in Oregon, I will tell you. It's much, much easier. Um, in Oregon, up until about the month I left, it had to be the clinician themselves that individually checked each person. Guess what? Didn't happen very often. It was a pain in the butt. Here we can delegate. It can happen easier. Use urine drug testing. Avoid concurrent benzodiazepines. Arrange treatment for opioid use disorder if needed. All good things. Number 12, kind of hard to do. So how many people in our system here at University of Washington are available to help treat opioid use disorder? Not very many. It's a huge shortage. 
And there's a couple other additional things. In general, increasing dosages to 50 or more milliequivalents a day increases overdose risk without necessarily adding benefits for pain control or function. Additional precautions should be taken when patients are prescribed daily opioid doses over 50 milliequivalents a day and generally should not go over 90, which we already talked about. Take additional steps to mitigate overdose risk for patients receiving total daily opioid dosages of greater than 50 milliequivalents a day, such as considering offering naloxone and overdose prevention to both patients and the patient's household members. This is a powerful little tool to have for talk, with talking with patients. And I'm seeing someone from a consult who's being referred because their primary care is worried about the prescribing that they're doing, that they started, that now is out of control. And the patient's on a big dose of opioids. I said, well, because of the risk of death, we should talk about what would happen if you were to have an overdose. You should have a prescription for naloxone available. This sometimes scares the bejesus out of people, which is OK with me. They should be scared. 16,000 deaths a year it should be scary. I'm going to change topics briefly. Tependidol has been in the United States for a while, not while now. FDA approved for painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy pain as well as chronic pain management. It is a potent opioid that also works on norepinephrine. It appears at equivalent dose to oxycodone, codone to have fewer side effects, including less sedation, less GI adverse effects. It's available both immediate relief and extended release. These are some selected 2015 papers with neuropathic focus. Um, so in the world of neuropathy, I think this is a, a drug that has an interesting role, potentially. Back to the naloxone thing. So many of you know the term Narcan, the, the brand name Narcan, right? So Narcan was the brand a million years ago. It kind of went away, but it's come back. That's several hundred dollars a squirt variety. Mm -hmm. So the new thing is to be able to have self-administered naloxone outside of the hospital setting. So there's two ways of doing that. It's either IV, IM, and people at home are going to usually find a vein unless they, are, they have those skills, which they might, <laughs> or nasal. So the IV, IM dose is 0.4 to 1 milligrams. The nasal dose is 2 to 4 milligrams. You can order it at the University of Washington. I did some checking. They're in the process of trying to standardize this here, but they make a home, the pharmacists in different places make a little, their own version of a kit, which is basically a vial and the ample thing and a nasal trumpet, they go squirt up the nose, two to four milligrams. Um, the ingredients in that kit used to cost about $3, but now it's like $80 for that. Um, there's also an automatic thing that is electric. It has a voice that tells you what to do in an emergency. And if you guys have seen this, it's, it's an electronic auto injector. You just put it against the thigh and put it through your pants. And it says, push the deploy button now. And it, and it shoots a little puncture into the, into the muscle right through the, right through the pants or clothing. If you want to undress the person, you can do that, but you don't have to. So naloxone is becoming more available. There's really super expensive forms and kind of more available forms. Insurance companies, including Medicaid, starting to pay for it if people are on opioids. So it's something to think about if people are at risk. Higher dose or if they have sleep apnea or some other but, extra yeah, risk. How many patients have you prescribed? Well, how many people do I prescribe opioids for? Hardly any. But anybody above 50 milliequivalents, I've had this conversation with. As of the last month or so. Yes? So what's the half-life of this, though? It's really short. Yeah, so you have to dial 911. Okay. <laughs> You, you, yeah, but, okay. Yeah. Is, is this really something? Yeah. I mean, it seems more like this could cause more problems than it would help. It hasn't. So, in, in areas where this has been around, so Massachusetts, mm -hmm. Massachusetts was the first state to really start rolling this out, and they showed a dramatic decrease in, in out of hospital overdose deaths. Well, cops are carrying it. Too, right? Cops are carrying it. EMTs. I mean, well, they won't do CPR, but I guess they'll get them along. So. Um, so it's a very interesting thing with 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 police officers. Yeah, I think you know, it's, it's, a, it's an emergency treatment, and it, it's, it's a temporizing emergency treatment. Okay, any, does anybody have any other opioid things I want to talk about? Is everybody sick and nauseated and ready to move on? I think there's always a concern in my clinic is that if you've been on opioid, it gets referred to as a because <laughs> no one else wants to deal with their opioids. And they, you give them this conversation about their all the risks, and then they say, 
that that's what works for me, it tried to take me off of it. It doesn't work for me. It works. And of course, when you give them the data, yeah, that's a waste of time to give them the data. It's a waste of time to give them the data. So the whole build up to that should be, tell me how much your life sucks. So I tell you all the ways in which your life sucks, all the things they can't do, how bad it is, um, and then say, well, let's try to think of some strategies to get that better. And so the fr your first is you have to kind of get them to buy in that it, they aren't really living in nirvana. They live someplace else. And that it's not so great. If it was so great, they wouldn't be sitting in front of you. Um, and, and then, have a conversation come a different way, R rather than just because facts aren't going to persuade them. It's got to be an emotional thing. Yes. Can you just talk about the short-acting versus long-acting debate issue yeah. in the hospital with like a, like an amputation patient, or this is not and the fact that after four hours they're back in pain. You're always chasing. And that was sort of what the way mm -hmm. it's been right. is considered. Yeah. So how, what is your, because this is, a, as you said, it's a change. What, how, how are you recommending managing that? So that is an area of evolution. So if the patients were not on opioids before at all, in general, the standard has evolved to be don't give them a long-acting form. Unless you've been working with them and they're clearly requiring opioids often and the taper's going to be slower rather than quicker like a, a slower healing process, like, like an amputation or something else. And that setting, start them, but not on day one or two, a little bit further down the road, based upon how much they're using and, they're, and some percentage of what they're using, in the 30 to 60% range of what they're using. So it's really quite different, because there is data from a decade ago or so saying that if you give people sustained release opioids um, for certain procedures, that they end up feeling better and not using more opioid necessarily. But the other thing that's evolved is that a lot of procedures that we used to routinely give a fair bit of opioids for are often done with a less invasive approach with multimodal analgesia, so they're getting ketamine and lidocaine and clonidine and a whole host of other things that can decrease the opioid requirements. So the opioid use is, is, that's needed is less. So the, the need for those may be decreasing from that standpoint. Opioid tolerant patient, totally different story. Do you agree that a big problem nationally is the uh, practices of dentists? Oh. That they, that they get way too much for relatively short acting procedures? Absolutely. I can tell you my state of Oregon experience, which is we had a, um, a big, the, the, the acting U.S. Attorney General call, called like a round table of all these different groups together to talk about the opioid prescription problems. The one group that didn't send a representative was the Dental Association. So they don't even see it as a problem. They don't recognize it as a problem. Some older surveys, when asking people, like, what was your first time you ever took a pain medication? It's related to dental experiences most commonly. So, yeah, it's where people get the taste for it. It's a huge problem. Yes? So, do you think our best first line drugs to use for somebody who's post procedure? This seems to be in the last five or ten years. People are running into a lot of all the time. And certainly when I trained, that wasn't a first line drug for, for acute pain. So I um, would say that there's no good data that says it has any benefit. In fact, there are head to head comparison studies for PCA, so not quite oral, but PCA that don't really show any advantage to starting off with hydromorphone as your first choice in PCA whatsoever like compared to morphine, compared to fentanyl, compared to anything else. No real advantages. Um, so I, I don't think hydromorphone should be the drug. I think it should be oxycodone. It is a reasonable choice, and so is morphine a reasonable choice. But that's so old-fashioned. I understand. And if the dose is low, you know, a combined fixed drug could be okay, too. You know, hydrocodone with acetaminophen attached. So it's still this was less expensive. Definitely an option. Okay. Thank you for not falling asleep on the opioid thing and staying interested. Okay. Something different. Spinal cord stimulation. Like I said, in the last year and a half, this is a completely different topic than it used to be. Um, so traditional spinal cord stimulation. Leads are placed in the epidural space. The leads are positioned to give a sensation of tingling or paresthesia over the area of pain. The leads have a whole bunch of contacts. Patient has control of the stimulation, you can turn it up, turn it down, can change the program, change the t intensity. Um, 
there's reprogramming that can occur. And if you think about 16 contacts, it only takes two to make a circuit. You can use four contacts to make a circuit. The permutations are huge. You can change pulse width. You can change all kinds of things. There's a lot of variety there. Um, and pretty good evidence it worked. Um, but that's the way we were. And the studies that I would quote when I would give a talk about Spanker simulation were really from a decade ago. Since then, the thing, things have really changed. Here's five new devices that weren't around a couple of years ago. Um, and from two of those are from companies that didn't exist a couple of years ago, that weren't selling any products in the United States or anywhere in the world a couple of years ago. So things really changed. Um, and there's actually way better data now, particularly for spinal pain. And then there's a recent, just published, which I did not include here, CRPS perspective randomized trial as well with new, new technology. Um, these have better outcomes, and they resemble the patients we see in our practice. And there's some comparative data, which is unique and different. So some of the new technologies. Uh, the one that's most broadly disseminated now is high-frequency stimulation. So high-frequency, 10,000 hertz, way above perception threshold, tons of energy required to do that, all kinds of interesting engineering required to make that happen. Um, the energy is so much that the systems have to be charged every one or two days to deliver this. Um, it's been available in the United States since last uh, spring and summer. Burst stimulation is little spikes of high frequency with a pause, spike and a pause, spike and a pause, spike and a pause, with multiple of those per second. Um, doesn't require quite as much energy as high frequency. Also does not cause a stimulate a sensation the patient can feel. Um, as it says available in Europe here, it's now the devices available here are starting to be used in the United States as well. High density is just a programming technique in which more, more energy is delivered using a frequency of around 1,000 to 1,200 hertz. Um, and uh, some emerging data with this is not quite as compelling as the other data, I would say. Dorsal root ganglion. This is a totally different kind of device that's put out outside of the, epidur outside of the spinal canal and actually hangs in circles the dorsal root ganglion. I'll show you a picture in a minute. And it stimulates right there. Very low energy requirements. Relatively focal stimulation. So it's not tradition, It's not spinal cord stimulation, which is stimulating the dorsal root ganglion. So it can be applied to areas that aren't otherwise considered to be good targets, like the foot or the groin. So it's a different target area. So let's talk about high frequency. So this is a <coughs> randomized control trial. 198 subjects with back and leg pain. And they randomized to two types of stimulation. A traditional stimulation system with the Boston Scientific System, not their most current system, however. Or to this new device, which is called the Senza from Nevro. After a trial in which the patient had to have, had to have at least 50% pain relief and improvement in function, 171 were planted. And the primary outcome was back pain reduction of greater than 50%. So that is completely revolutionary. There's never been a clinical trial done for stimulation in which back pain was the primary outcome measure. It's always been the neuropathic leg pain component for these patients, but this is different. This is back pain as the primary outcome. At three months, 84.5% of the people getting high frequency were responders, pain reduced by 50% or more in their back, 83% for their leg pain, versus 43% for traditional stim for the back and 55% for the leg. The relative ratio for responders was 1.9. It's almost twice as likely to respond if you've got the high frequency for the back pain and 1.5 for the leg pain. And they're able to say it was superior to traditional stimulation, they're able to get labeling saying it's superior to traditional stimulation on the device. How did these data compare to the situation? There's a whole bunch of stuff which I, I'm, I'm not going to show you here, but there's all kinds of things, which is a look. It's, it's an amazing study for multiple reasons. One is they didn't lose anybody in a year. They had, everybody they, they touched at the beginning, they still had a year later, which is phenomenal for a study this size. Um, and here's you know, the, the kind of number of people who had pain scores less than 2.5. Just phenomenal. 65% of people at three months, and 68% 68 at 12 months. Think of the medication you can give to someone with chronic back and leg pain. It's going to make their pain go from, on average, 7 or 8 to less than 
I don't know what that medication is. So this is really different than anything else we can offer them. And it's really pretty impressive. There's another really unique feature about this. They don't feel stimulation. So if I'm doing a spinal stimulator trial on a patient, up until now, the way that worked is they're lying on their stomach. Um, they have some sedation to tolerate having a procedure. I thread a lead or two up. We turn it on. We say, OK, tell us where you feel the tingling. And they tell us where they feel the tingling. And I adjust it until they feel paresthesias where their pain is. And then we leave it there. And then we play with it during the trial. They don't feel tingling, so we can't do that. So instead, with the preliminary data, they try to figure out where the targets were for high frequency stimulation. And they realized it was some place between kind of T8 and T11. So their idea was just thread a lead that goes up the top of T8, another one that comes down to sort of at least the top of T11, just put them in, and then we'll play with the programming later. So it makes trialing quite a different experience. It's like putting an epidural catheter in someone. It's not the whole back and forth, half an hour, an hour, of moving a little left, a little right, a little up, a little down, trying to find the quote sweet spot. You find the sweet spot later with programming. It's completely different. The other thing is that they don't feel anything. With traditional stimulation, if you extend like this, you feel more stimulation. With this, you don't feel anything. So you don't think about it when you're moving it. So basically, they once a day charge it, turn it on. If they want to carry their thing with them to turn it off and on, they can, but they don't usually need to do anything. So if they're a responder to this technology, it's quite cool. Burst stimulation, that's what the burst stimulation pattern looks like. Five bursts, pause, five, five, five waveforms, pause, five waveforms, pause. So this is a small little study at, but it shows that there's changes in different parts of the brain than with traditional stimulation. So it looks to decrease the affective component of the, of the pain more than traditional stimulation. Kind of cool looking. And then here's a study in which they randomly assign people to either burst or high frequency, and then follow them over the course of three months and show they both equally reduce pain, high frequency, and burst. So two new stimulation patterns that really only available within the last year in the United States. Um, completely different than we've had before. DRG, that's what it looks like. It's really, really totally different than anything we've ever had, where you take the needle, you start over here, you bump up against this pedicle, and you make it do a 90 degree turn and come out here. And then once you do that, you pull back the stylet, you put this loop in so it'll stay. So it delivers low level of energy, and most of it is given through this distal contact or at the DRG. <clears throat> this has some interesting outcomes. It looks really promising for certain kinds of patients. I have big hesitations about this. There's no one currently as of today in the state of Washington doing this. There will be providers soon doing it, but no one is doing it yet. Um, after this has been in for a month or so, it becomes kind of permanent and kind of a big deal to take it out. So it becomes part of them. So if they need an MRI, it might be a problem. There must be some placebo effect of uh, doing this kind of thing. Is that the measure? Well, most placebo effects don't last a year, though, right? Um, some do, but it's hard for me to argue like what that would be. Um, and well, it, my my problem is I can't think of any neural structure that could follow a thousand hertz, let alone ten thousand. That was the discussion for years and years and years. And the thing that's really cool about about this is that there's you know, it, it's prompted a whole bunch of different, different uh, research, right? So one of my colleagues um, in Portland who actually did a year of neurology here, uh, Andre Sadrula, um, actually has a little model of rodents in which he does stimulation on the spinal cord to try to look at these, what these different stimulation models do in the dorsal horn. So it's, you're right. That was the big take. Like, for the first three years people were talking about this, everyone said, well, it doesn't make any sense. It can't work. And they start bringing out this data, and bringing out this data, and bringing out this data, um, and with the largest studies ever published in stimulation. So I, I hear you. And the, the control is not a placebo, but it's very hard to have a control. Um, ethically, it's not, it's not impossible. This actually brings about the possibility. The, um, the burst one was placebo. 
in which the patients either had a device implanted and either had no stimulation or had burst stimulation. Um, the, so far, there's not been a 10 kilohertz study with a, a placebo arm. The placebo arm, almost always to get past an ethics committee, would be implanting a device, not having it be turned on by using a dummy controller um, in a dummy system of charging versus having it on and really charging and really being controlled. Because the patients couldn't feel the difference, couldn't feel whether it's on or not. So it seems like it's ready for a placebo arm, but the placebo is still going to involve surgery. <laughs> so it's a kind of a big placebo. So you, you said that the, the DRG one is very hard to take down. The high frequency one, is, is that also something that's permanent? <clears throat> well, it's implanted permanently, so but, it's, but, if, but if the per if person says, I no longer need it, or they need, medically need to take it out, it's a simple procedure to take it out. And is that durable? Like, like if, you, if you turn it off, does this effect last, or is, is, is there a pain, 50% pain reduction only for it? Like, do you want that for life, or is that...? Potentially. Okay. So, the, the, the way people use stimulation is really quite different. And, I, you know, I didn't do a whole stimulation talk, so it's just supposed to be new, new things. But there's a really cool German guy named Harka, um, who's, public, who's published some really fun stuff. And all his publications, he, and all his clinical practices, every three months he makes everybody turn them off. And then you have to come back to him after a few days and say what they miss, and what they want it back on or not. So this whole idea is take out devices that aren't needed anymore. How so, expensive? huh? Expensive? Oh, they're very expensive. Then you can buy a really nice car for the price of these. What's the theory for how it works? For the high, which one? For the burst. The burst. The theory is that for some reason it's uh, it's stimulating. Well, there's multiple theories. Let's start with that, right? No one knows how spinal cord stimulation of any variety works. Like literally, no one knows, right? It was started because of gate control theory thoughts. Within two years, the first one was ever, ever in the world was, was placed after the gate control theory was published. Um, you know, it turned out there's not really T cells back there waiting to be stimulated. So no one really knows. But, the, but, there, but there's a whole bunch of suggestive evidence of things. So there's changes in glial cell activation. There's changes, changes in descending inhibition that happens. The changes in limbic, limbic system function. For the burst, it looks like there's a lot more of that limbic system change with the stimulation than, than for the other kinds of stimulation. High frequency has not been studied well enough in an fMRI kind of kind of setting to really have a good feeling for how that works yet. So, yes? The only non-industry sponsored study, study ever published in 2000 in New England Journal of Medicine with extremely old technology, as you can imagine, it was complex regional pain syndrome funded by the Dutch Health Council. It was complex regional pain syndrome patients who randomized two to one to stimulation versus um, physical therapy and, and conservative care. And um, at two years, there was clearly a difference between the, the groups. Um, and it was about 56 or 60 patients, something like that number of people. Um, the steps were just the traditional steps of so the trial first and then the implant. About a third of the patients didn't, or a quarter, somewhere between a quarter and a third, did not succeed with the trial and were not implanted. At five years, looking at the intent to treat group, which includes the people that failed the trial, there wasn't a big difference. But if you looked at just the ones that actually got the device, they were still different and they still liked it. And like 95% of them said they'd do it again for the same outcome. So that's the only non-industry funded study. These things are ridiculously expensive. Like really expensive. And doing a study is really, really expensive. So um, some of them still try to bill insurance while doing a clinical trial. Boston Scientific has a d new device coming out that can be both high frequency and traditional stimulation in theory. I haven't seen the data to support it quite yet, so they're not FDA approved. But for their study, they pay for every single thing for two years for the patient, which had to have been many, many, many millions of dollars. And there's no source for studies like that besides industry. So you're talking about 50,000 and you're talking about 100,000 how much are you talking about? That range. Somewhere in that range. <clears throat> so there's, um, I can show you, I have a nice little slide that kind of talks about that. So it also depends what country you're in, of course, with, in this country, it also depends which insurance company you have. So it's almost twice as much here as it is 150 miles north of us, which is amazing. Um, but that's true. And um, uh, the, the maintenance costs, after about two years,
for people who've had failed back surgery syndrome, quote, as their diagnosis, that the cost starts to be cheaper than their other costs would have been to the system. If I can, I can show you that. There's like a really good paper from like two or three years ago. And there's an economist who's in Britain who worked for NICE, you know, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, NICE, that says, no, we do this, and yes, we do whatever, um, has published some really good stuff about cost effectiveness in Britain. So most of the best data comes from outside of the U.S. We're supposed to be asking you to repeat the question. Oh, I, I apologize. Yeah. Thank you for... No worries. Reading. No worries. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. There's a little bit of data which was never very convincing before for spine cord stimulation in the past. There remains no good modern data. So this is the best data I can find. It's a randomized controlled trial. SES versus control. Showing reduction in pain. This, is, this looks about equivalent to pharmacotherapy response. So enough about that. Next new thing, which is not that new, we just talk about it really briefly, which is the whole idea of graded motor imagery and rehab approaches for, for pain management. Um, it's retraining the brain. The early descriptions were mainly for phantom limb pain, stroke, and CRPS. And it starts with imagined movements, lateral retraining, and involves things like mirror, the mirror. If you talk to patients who've been to a physical therapist who's not really fully trained, they just plop a mirror down in front and say, okay, imagine, you know, make both things move and it doesn't hurt. And, and like, they don't get it, it doesn't work. And there was a belief that that was enough to do it. But it's really this whole complicated way of retraining your brain. And there's pretty good data. For CRPS, there's better data for this than for any other physical therapy approach, as an example. And they're starting to be using this idea of imagined movements and progressing to real life movements and, and looking at how your body is in space with a bunch of other conditions, including cancer pain and back pain. So it's becoming a little bit more mainstream, at least in the literature. It's hard to find practitioners out in the community. The, the best practitioners have attended a training from, sponsored by this group right there, the, the NOI group, who, who does, who brought this out and brought it into, into the forefront. So it, it's a cool thing to look at. I'm trying to get it more broadly available next door to me at the Exercise Training Center, but we're not quite there yet. So something to think about for you, mainly unilateral neuropathic pain patients. The other thing is just exercise in general. I know you see a lot of patients with neuropathy, um, and there's evidence that it can improve, that sending someone to, for exercise can improve balance and endurance and decrease fall risk, less neuropathy. And that can be pretty severe falls um, pretty severe neuropathy patients respond to that. Um, but then there's two studies with early on neuropathy or patients at risk for neuropathy showing improvement in small fiber density over time with an with a exercise program. Supervised exercise, structured exercise program. Improvement in small fiber density. That is pretty cool. So those are kind of early on patients. So my takeaway is that for peripheral neuropathy patients, it really makes sense to think about talking about the exercise component. If that involves having them go see a trainer, if that involves having them go see the physical therapist, it's a good idea. If they're really relatively early on, it's more the neuropathy concerns and pain concerns, it's quite different than later on when there's, or, or when, there's, when the pain is predominating. But I, I think both early and late in the course of neuropathy, it's worth thinking about therapy. Maybe if they had it early and it's been a while and things have changed, it's worth thinking about doing it again. Brandon said, even that's true for just any painful neuropathy, which is primarily diabetic. That's, oh, it, the question is, is it true? Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Natalia. Um, the question is, is it true for any neuropathy or just diabetic neuropathy? Who the hell knows, right? Because the only neuropathy that's really steady is diabetic neuropathy for any treatment. Um, so, but it makes sense for diabetic neuropathy because it's potentially high no, blood. Yes. So if you look back, so there was, they, they try to control for that and showed an, what appeared to be an independent effect, separate from glucose control and, and, and weight things. So there were general health benefits, but when they controlled for those, it looked like there's an additional effect beyond that, that just as done by the exercise itself. That's a good question. There's a, there's a lot of data available about exercise uh, in the role regrowth or birth, uh, there are some, there's some capacity to regenerate neurons in adulthood, and it's very stimulating by exercise. So this wouldn't be necessarily in the periphery, but it might be in the thalamus or mm -hmm. dorsal horn of the spinal cord, where some of these 
pathways become chronically active. All right. So, yeah, our current belief, like, you know, Dr. Rasmussen said, is the regeneration of nerves on BDNF and mm -hmm. plasma is a factor. But he also said increasing the wrong density, density. So peripherally. I don't know that. I do not know. So the question is, what's, the, what, what's behind the increased peripheral nerve density, fiber density? And I have no clue. How's that? <laughs> I'm just re reporting what people are talking about, right? So I, I, but exercise is key to every, every pain treatment. And um, one of the things I think is kind of, uh, I'm struggling to think of the right word but is embarrassing maybe about the place where I work currently is that our lack of integration with physical therapy and exercise. Um, it's a little bit of a black box the way things are set up now and I'm trying my hardest to change that but it's been a slower process than I would like. We can't just you know, give them drugs and talk to them about their mental health and coping if we don't actually show them how to use their bodies out there. So that's just, this is just a plug to do that. Okay, we're running out of time, so I'm gonna go faster. I don't have much left. So fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia is a very interesting topic. Uh, 1990 was when the, the term really came into the literature. The diagnostic criteria published at American College of Rheumatology. Um, and the idea was that patients with widespread pain of more than three months, and widespread defined as above and below the waist on the right and the left, um, with having tenderness that they said was a pain, pain, painful, Painful on palpation at 11 out of 18 or more of the prescribed 18 tender points had fibromyalgia. So that was the, the diagnostic criteria for a long time. They seem remarkably simple to me, but evidently they were challenging for others. Um, so in 2010 and 2011, way more elaborate criteria were published, which supposedly are simpler. Um, and they basically a lot of self-report stuff about widespread pain, about so how severe the pain is, about accompanying fatigue, and sleep. A whole bunch of things factor into the diagnosis. And now the term is evolving and there is no consistent use of how to describe this. Is it fibromyalgia? Is it central sensitization? Is it chronic widespread pain? Um, well, the ICD-10 currently is fibromyalgia. There is no you can't find central sensitization pain or chronic widespread pain in there, so it's not there. It's, it's fibromyalgia. Um, but then there's some really cool data coming out, mainly the University of Michigan, showing that even if people are kind of along the spectrum towards fibromyalgia, they are different from people that aren't like that. That like there's degrees of sensitization, and in the more highly you score on this kind of this kind of scoring system, which I'll show you right here, the more likely you are to do to ink have more resource utilization, to um, do poor with interventions, to, to have a bunch of things that make you look more and more like a fibromyalgia patient, even if you're sub-diagnostic sub for that. So the way it's scored currently is with the wide, widespread pain index, where they ask, check off a bunch of parts of the body that hurt their shoulders, their elbows, their arms, their knees, their hips, that kind of stuff. And then, then the symptom severity score about how bad it is with fatigue and waking and refresh and cognitive symptoms. Um, so this really is different way of thinking. The patient fills out a survey, you can score it, you don't have to touch them, and you can come up with a risk factor for them being like fibromyalgia. Um, so it's a predictor of all kinds of things. Poor outcome after you get a new knee or hip, no matter what the pathology of the knee and hip is. Having higher score in the fibromyalgia score, uh, fibromyalgia testing, you know, the, the paperwork, makes you less likely to do well at six months. Patients referred for spine pain who have fibromyalgia, guess what? They don't respond to injections quite the same as those that don't have fibromyalgia. On my end, trust me, that's not surprising. But others seem to find that surprising. Um, and also people who come for, for, with kind of more fibromyalgia symptoms, even though they identify their back pain or their neck pain as the problem, tend to be much higher resource utilizers than those, those without. Um, and then if you look at people on higher dose of opioids and with high doses, high levels of pain, fibromyalgia is way overrepresented in that crowd. And it's only diagnosed in about a tenth of the people who meet the diagnostic criteria, the newer diagnostic criteria for fibromyalgia. So often prescribers are writing for patients, writing opioids for patients who aren't responding at higher doses and they have underlying fibromyalgia. And there's zero 
evidence that opioids work in that patient population. So it's a big deal thing. So what are we doing about it? We now, in our pain tracker, are assessing it with the fibromyalgia uh, questions and scoring it. We get an FM score for every pain tracker. And we're starting to look at it in terms of outcomes and associate it with uh, treatments that we offer patients. So briefly ending on some new things at the Center for Pain Relief. We're starting to do IV lidocaine infusions in the very near future. It's taken a very long time to make this happen. I won't really talk about the data behind it. It's not terribly robust, but there's a whole bunch of small studies, typically with a dose range of three to five milligrams per kilogram. Um, Misha Bishkonia, who's joined our group at the University of Wisconsin, used a much higher dose of, excuse me, of 500 milligrams um, as a flat dose. Um, and I told him we were not going to be able to do that here. So we're starting at a lower dose. Maybe it will work after this higher Wisconsin dose. We're also using more radio frequency for things that there was never radio frequency before, like knees and hip pain. I just saw someone today who um, has seen Dr. Weiss in the past who needs a no, new total hip, kind of youngish, kind of obese, kind of deconditioned, kind of scary to surgeons. So I'm going to talk to her about doing this as a kind of interim as we work on our weight and other stuff. We're also starting to have a collaborative effort with the surgeons about persistent postoperative groin pain, which probably has a nerve injury basis so for a lot of those people, in a way of handling those patients systematically. We're starting to do the, uh, more uh, spinal cord simulator trials here. We have some shared space with Natalia, and including uh, using our conference room for groups and other things. And in 2017, we're going to probably be having an opioid taper clinic within our clinic for internal UW patients. Um, and also a CRPS clinic, so working on some new things. Patients are often sent to us for interventions or to think about interventions. And the more of these things they have, the more likely they are to benefit from intervention. So they have localized pain. Everything adds up, the history of the physical, the diagnostic testing. It's based upon who they are, not their imaging. They don't have out-of-control distress, mood, and medical illness. They've really tried some conservative care before they're coming to see us. Um, and they have reasonable expectations for what's going to happen. They know we're not going to cure them with whatever we do. Have you ever had a patient like that? All the time. <laughs> they, actually, they actually come. They actually do show up. These are, I won't call them bad, let's just say less good candidates, which are the opposite of everything, right? Um, and so I really give people different talks if they're this. And I, was this, were you guys doing this before? Is this motivational intervening you at all? So when patients come to me and they're more like the less good candidate, I say, you were referred by Dr. Whoever for, for this procedure. I don't think we're quite ready to do it yet. We, we need to work together to get you ready to do that. So if they can make some of those things better and under control, they end up with a more focal problem. They know who we are. They trust us now. They're calmer. That they know what to expect. Maybe they become a better candidate. But just because they walk through the door and they have a herniated disc and all five radiculopathy doesn't mean I'm going to poke a needle. Um, and because you have to put it into the overall context. Another way of thinking about it is these people don't do so well, right? Train wrecks. So it's people like that. And you have to be realistic. We're not really substance abuse specialists. We can't really unwreck that train. Um, and if, if, if you're the primary provider for that condition, maybe not just PCP, but, but like you're the neurologist who's driving their care, you can't just say, you know, go see them, bye, never again. Because you know, no matter what image of a train wreck you have, you're still a train wreck. Um, and so the goal is not to make that train running again, but to kind of salvage. It's different. So that's my five things. Happy to discuss. Any other questions or comments? Can I just say that uh, I came here with some trepidation that you did a great job of educating this room, I think, about uh, some of the new strategies. Thank you. Uh, so for that, thank you very much. That, uh, I'm hugely optimistic about what you're trying to do. Can you tell us who are the best people to refer to you from neurology? Oh. Is there a group that you think are really ideal candidates? Dr. Weiss has it down to science. I love the patients he's in. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I like neuropathic pain patients who want to do something different. That's about it. Is there a group of patients that uh, you pointed out some patients that the 
risks for productive treatment may be lower, or, or they may have a, a profile that just isn't going to be very amenable uh, to successful treatment. Are there some classes of patients that just don't work out? I mean, so I think the patients are less likely to work out are, are patients who um, have barriers to care. So a barrier to care can be they live live further away. Um, you know, every one of these barriers can be overcome by motivation. But they live further away. They have fewer resources at their disposal. They have more mental illness. Um, and, and also, I think people do less well if they have a very focused treatment idea. They think they need X, Y, and Z to treat their condition. They're not focused on what are my goals of treatment? My goals are to be able to you know, garden or do something with the grandkids or just get a better night's sleep. If they're not goals that we can focus on like that, that that's not as good. If they're focused on what the treatment they think they need is and, they, and there's barriers to them actually coming to engage in treatment, those are the people that don't do as well. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, pardon me? Oh. Oh. I should probably read it here. Um, so I actually do think that, so the, the question is Annette Tu's question about um, being trained in how to do the tender point exam and also about the questionnaires. And I actually do think the questionnaires are really, really, really helpful. And so, because the evidence that's emerging is that the more areas a patient pain checks, the more sleep problems they have, the more fatigue problems they have, the more likely they are to not do as well. You should treat them like a fibromyalgia patient. So I actually think that that's a really good thing. I also do think that the patients that have the widespread tenderness are a different subset. And there's, I actually spent way too long looking at a couple of recent papers about this before for this presentation, because I didn't talk about them, about this idea that we, maybe we shouldn't throw that baby completely out the bathwater. Um, but the tender point exam, there are some videos on YouTube about how to do it. It's not, it's, it's not totally rocket science um, to go through those 18. You just don't want to push too hard. It's just you know, four, four pounds of pressure, just a little bit of pressure at each of those spots, and just yes or no is a pain point. I just instruct them. This is like a black, white, yes, no test. Is it hurt or not? I'm going to touch a few places. You can say yes, you can say no, there's not a right answer. I'm just going to go through it. The other question is, um, is IV lidocaine currently available? Exclusion criteria, any particular diagnosis you find it most useful for? It is on the cusp of being available. Um, I, did it all, I did it pretty frequently down in Portland. And I think it works best for uh, neuropathic pain, often with an allodynic component to it. Um, and probably best if you kind of set people up to do it every week or every other week for two, two to four times and, and see the response. If patients hate the experience of the first one, I don't do it again. If they don't have any response, despite me getting five milligrams per kilogram, then I don't do it again either. Um, contraindications are cardiac issues. So if they have, they have conduction that delays, that's really the, the, the main problem. Or they're at risk for, for dysrhythmia. That's the main contraindication. How young would you people? Usually 18-ish. Occasionally a little bit younger. I have a little host of high school girls right now. And so what do you do for the fibromyalgia kids? I mean, I know, you know, like they walk in the room and the mom's got fibromyalgia and mm -hmm. it's not lighting. They're going to be different. They're going to be different so for a long time. How do you, what's your road to success for those kids? Well, that's cha well. First, children are not my specialty. Let, 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 let's make make sure we understand this. Children are not my specialty. I'll say it really loud. Yes. Um, really, kind of start talking about goals for what they want to do, and strategies for being able to gradually increase. Rather than focus on the things they can't do, what are some things they can do now that may seem kind of trivial, but they're more than they're doing, and kind of start getting them to move that way. And they kind of reformulate what they're what they're doing. So that can be exercise, it can be mental activity, it can be structured pattern for how they get to sleep. It can be lots of different things. No magic wand. No, no magic wand. No magic wand. And then getting rid of drugs that don't work. That's the other thing. <laughs> get rid of things that aren't working. When they come in and they show me all the things they're doing, okay, and you're not satisfied with your pain treatment, then let's get a clean slate and start over. You know what? There should be a clinic someplace uh, run by a super expert like you 
called the Medication Discontinuation Clinic, <laughs> where you would send patients to kind of pry them away from medicines that don't work, but they're very attached to. Oh, and, and their descriptions are so great. Like, I take my amitriptyline to help me with sleep. I take my cyclobenzaprine, which only has one hydrogen atom different and no difference at all in mechanism of action, to because it relaxes my muscles, and there's no evidence it does any of that. I take this for that. You know, like people have all their rationales and explanations. It's a lot of mythology to break down there. Thank you so much. Thank you.